As I mentioned earlier, tonight we're uh, highlighting the MAC program. The MAC program is particularly uh, important to me because I'm an accounting graduate of our undergraduate program. Uh, for many years I taught in the program. I had the honor of serving as the associate dean of the program. And so my first home is in the accounting area and in the MAC program. And uh, a little bit of information about our current MAC program, which is much bigger and better than when I was involved with it. We now have two formats, our campus MAC and our online MAC with 250 students uh, on the online format and about 150 on campus. Um, it has always been viewed as one of the very best in the country. 21 staff uh, people support those students. We're in our 32nd year of a MAC program. We have about 800 applicants to the program and 99%, which is about as close as you can get to 100% of job placement with the best accounting firms and other companies in the world. The program now uh, has a larger reach geographically and more talent, more touches, more students, and more fellowships than it ever has. I want to highlight a couple of key fellowships tonight. One is the Lewis M. Burton Master of Accounting Fellowship. I know Lewis is here tonight. Uh, I can't see with bright lights, but Lewis, if you can wave your hand. There he is, right there in the middle. <laughs> Lewis is a recent recipient of our alumni award um, for the MAC program. Uh, Lewis was the first African-American uh, member of the business school student body and a longtime um, accountant in Chicago with Arthur Anderson and then in the corporate world and has become a friend of mine uh, since retiring and moving back to Durham. And uh, it is a great honor to have uh, Lewis with us and to have this fellowship uh, with his name associated with it. Uh, Lewis, it's great to have you here tonight. We also have the Freddie and Susan Robinson Scholarship and Accounting Fund, and this is the first ever needs-based scholarship specifically for the MAC program. We have a lot of students in the MAC program who have just come straight through the undergraduate program, have uh, amassed considerable um, debt uh, going through the undergraduate program, and this is, is set aside for students of that particular type to enable them to um, more easily finance the cost of the MAC program. It's now my honor to introduce uh, tonight's speaker, Eddie Sams. Um, Eddie is an avid gardener, fisherman, traveler. He and his wife, Pam Brock, are the proud parents of five children and grandparents of, of two grandchildren. He's a, uh, he loves to come back to Carolina. He follows the Tar Heels as often as he can. Eddie retired in 2013 after 42 years at Dixon Hughes Goodman LLP, where he served as CEO for 25 years and as the firm's initial chairman for four. Eddie spearheaded the strategic direction and growth of the firm to what is today the nation's 17th largest CPA firm with over 2,000 people in 13 states. In 2014, he established a MAC scholarship fund at UNC. He currently works on the boards of Higher Education Works and the North Carolina Association of CPAs, where he serves on a task force assessing the health and wellness of accounting programs across the UNC system. His bio goes on and on, but I will give you a little personal anecdote. I do not believe there is a person who better exemplifies what it means to be a CPA in the state of North Carolina than Eddie Sams. I have told people before, he knows more CPAs in this state Personally, he has recruited more of them at this university, and he has stayed in contact with more of them the rest of his life than anybody I know. I sometimes refer to him as the godfather of North Carolina CPAs. It's my pleasure to welcome Eddie Sams. Well, I'll tell you, Doug, after that, I'm just glad I can walk up here. Uh, now, I got a call from uh, Tom Myrick. I don't know if any of y'all know 
Tom Myrick. He's in development. He only calls for two reasons. <laughs> it's either money or there's something else he wants you to do. Uh, so as soon as I got past the piece, it wasn't going to be money. And he asked, would I be willing to speak at this thing? I said, Tom, I think that one's my favorite event. And there's nothing that I'd rather do. So he put a couple parameters on it. He said, uh, hold it to 10, but by God, don't go past 15. So Pam's down here, and at eight minutes, she's putting the two up. Uh, and if it's, if it's much worse than that, you can all put your hands up. We'll, we'll sit down. Tom asked me, you know, I said, well, what, what do I talk about? He said, well, tell about your story. I said, well, Tom, you know, I change that story occasionally. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I've, I've done that here once, but, but let me go again in terms of what I'm about and where I'm from. And those of us who grew up in the South, those are the questions you ask. And then all of a sudden you realize you're first cousins or something. And uh, <laughs> then you stop talking. But I grew up in a family where both parents were ministers. And that was the Salvation Army. And that was the group that, in that organization, the women made the same amount of money as the men. And the women also had the same title as the men. That was quite an experience in terms of just what that did. We moved around every five years. And, and that was because my dad ran out of sermons and we'd move on to the next town. <laughs> but I spent seven years and I'm getting to why I'm covering this, working at a summer camp up in Washington, outside of Washington, D.C. And it was there, and it was church camp, it was Salvation Army camp. Uh, if you know anyone that goes to Salvation Army or anything like that, none of us had any money. But half of that summer, after the church part, was the inner city kids. And it was the boys and girls clubs. And it was Buck Covington, a school teacher, who spent every summer of his, his career helping those kids there in DC. Uh, that's where I built my entire resume so I could interview for jobs. My first job was junior counselor. Then I moved up to counselor. Then I got up to nature counselor. And then I came to Chapel Hill and got my WSI so I could go back and be water safety instructor, waterfront director and all that. And that's, uh, that was the amount of experience I had. Today our kids are getting so much more than that in terms of the internships and everything else that goes on. But I look at uh, since retirement, one of my partners said, Eddie, looking back, when you started, and when we started, of course, I was in High Point, and as Phil will tell you, big things happened in High Point, Phil Phillips. We had about 30 people. And we started growing. And I said, you know, we gotta do something about the staffing. The first thing I did was show up back on this campus because I knew what it was. And I spent 20 years doing my best to recruit here. But if you look back to my class, and I finished up in the fall of 70, actually January 71, we were right there with you. We were on the bleeding edge of technology. I was down there in the basement at Phillips Hall, just punching away on that key punch. And I swear if I could have gotten a clean compile one more time, I might have gone that way. But we'd, we'd get it punched up, then we'd put a rubber band around it, and then it'd get transmitted to somewhere in Research Triangle Park. And you just prayed to God you had a clean pile. Because if you did, you got to do amazing things. 
you could take the first chapter of Genesis and you could input all the words and it would sort them and it would, it would count how many times you said God, you know. And I showed that one to my dad because it said God. And I, he said, wow, this is something. I said, he said I, I said, we got a language. We're, we're learning a language, COBOL. And dad said, there's no country called COBOL. <laughs> and I said, dad, it's a made up language. He said, Eddie. I want to remind you what I've told you about making things up. <laughs> and it went from there. But if I go back to my class, and Danny Newcomb was right behind me a year, uh, I think I was probably his grader. I think there was probably 40, 45 of us. And I look up at the makeup of it, Lewis, and there was one African American, Kenneth Johnson, He's a, an attorney now in uh, Greensboro, doing, doing well. Betty Hunter, who retired from our firm as a partner. And then another lady, I think it was Suzanne DuPont. So it was about 40, 45 of us. One African American, two women. So where have we gone? If you look back to then, we had wonderful role models. And I'm telling you, it's, it's Ike Reynolds is the reason I'm here. It's Ike Reynolds is the reason I got a job in High Point. I thought twice, but yeah, I'll go to High Point. But it was also Harold Langendurfer, who was probably as smart as any man I've ever known. And then we had the professors from the other parts of the School of Business. Pro Professor Levin, I think it was Dick Levin, he was just absolutely amazing. And you cannot discount the fact that it's the PhDs, it's the faculty in this School of Business. They're our role models. They're the last, last group that has a shot at us before we get turned loose out in the world of business. So I went ahead, I, 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 I interviewed for an internship. Uh, they said, uh, and they prepped us probably like they do all you scholars. Just relax. Be yourself. Well, after about the third interview, relax was out the daggone window. <laughs> and I wasn't sure being yourself was getting me anywhere either. And it was Ike Reynolds that said, Eddie, I want you to talk to Phil Dixon. I knew as soon as I talked to Phil, here was the key. He told me he thought I, that Madras sport coat I was wearing was nice. <laughs> so I could be myself again. And I could be relaxed. It took off from there. The greatest thing, though, in terms of Oh, I forgot Junius Terrell in terms of professors. Back then we started in September, CPA exam was in November. You were gonna start the textbook and you'd have it finished for the first week of November. And then he wanted to see the passing rates. Wanted to make sure everybody passed and we got through it. But if you look back to that time and then in terms of coming back on campus, it was then, it was no longer professor. It was Ike, it was Harold, it was Junius. Just a great, great time. When I was asked, you know, looking back on the firm, what it's done, you must uh, really, f did you ever have any idea it would be what it has become? Well, I acted like I kind of thought it could go that way. But I know this. If you want to grow a, a practice in public accounting, the key to it is get your rear end back on campus and don't miss a daggone function in terms of seeing the students. And that, that, that was true then, it's true now in terms of that relationship. It's, uh, it was, I think it was in 1993 that we'd, I decided to go, we were going to Mexico City. We were going to expand our group. It was time to get global. 
My meeting, though, happened to be there the weekend of the Final Four. <laughs> we were playing Michigan. And, I, I, and Jay Motzinger, my partner, he's a PCU grad, I said, we're not staying unless we can find that game. And we got it on the screen. And we watched us beat the Fab Five. That's what happened at the end, those of you who were alive, they called a timeout and they didn't have one. The biggest problem I had after that was going down to the bar and trying to explain to the staff down there what a Tar Heel is. <laughs> and after a while, explaining, they finally came over with a Negro Medela, put it down to Tar Heel. <laughs> and that's one of the assignments all of you have as scholars, you're, tr you're going to travel the rest of the world. And it's important that we let the rest of the world know what Kingdom Flagler is all about. And more importantly than that, we need to tell them what a Tar Heel is. Now, Lewis over here, who's fluent in Spanish, I said, Lewis, I passed him a note. Can you tell me exactly how you say Tar Heel in Spanish? Doug, we're holding his money up. Uh, because he can't quite get the translation <laughs> of what it means to be a Tar Heel in Spanish. But we're going to maybe let him off the hook. As far as the inclusion and diversity, we sat down with Professor Han back in 08 to say, can we as a firm put some money back into this program to do some recruiting? Because that's what it is, to get better stats. And I think at that point, our uh, underrepresented minorities was where we were at 3%, if I recall. We had already had a profound change in terms of women in the profession. That was already happening and was underway. But we just weren't there yet in terms of, of the underrepresented minorities. As we look at those efforts and what's so good to see today, if you look at the stats of this program, as far as the on-campus, and this is uh, June of 17, 46% women, but it's not 3% underrepresented minorities, it's 16. And that's a great, great step forward. As far as the online program, the average age on the campus piece was 24. And what's being done with this online program, I think it's gonna make us even more diverse. If you look at the group that came in for June of 17, there were 93, I think, that entered then. That average age was 32. That's the BSBAs who were out of money and had to take a job and couldn't afford to take that next step. And we've opened that door for them. And for that group, the underrepresented minority percentage is 34%. It's a fabulous, Fabulous uh, development uh, in my mind. If you look at what Doug mentioned on our North Carolina Association, Bill Azale, who's an alum, Kelly Noble, also an alum with Grant Thornton, uh, myself, Malcolm Coley from Ernst, and a couple others, we did a survey of the eight MAC programs within the UNC system. My concern was, I already knew, there were no raises for several years with state money. And then when they had raises, they were maybe a thousand bucks a year. Maybe it was a cup of coffee a week. Maybe that's what it was. But if, as we got that survey back, we saw that 74% of the accounting faculty, and I bet if we had expanded it to the full school of business, it would have been the same, were below the marketplace that they benchmark against. And that was the average. We have some schools that were below, above that. We also had salary inversions. If you don't know what that is, that's where the private is making more money than the sergeant. It's not good uh, in terms of inside the house. Those are things that uh, we were identifying there. We. Higher Education Works, which uh, Paul Fulton 
one of our former deans, he, he chairs. I'm on that board. Phil Phillips is on that board. Sally Schupin's on that, that board. We had a speaker, or Tim Moore, Speaker of the House. I said, Speaker Moore, why in the world we've got the STEM set aside? The schools of business pay for themselves every bit as much as any of the STEM majors. And the return on investment from this group of scholars right here will be paid back in no time. If they do it right, they're going to double their salary every five years till you know, they can't double it anymore. Sally, though, at least chimed in, said, uh, what, Eddie? Because I was trying to say, well, you know, accountants, we do some sort of math. And Sally Schupin said, you know, well, we could add an A and call it STEAM for you, Eddie. <laughs> and uh, it was at that point I think I closed my discussion. But let me share one thing in terms of the need for keeping this program at the top. We will be nothing but average to mediocre if we don't have the private money to keep us at market. And as you, as students going out as scholars, you look at how do you get back, and I ask all of our scholars, you know, how'd you get here? And the influence for one of them was Boys and Girls Club. They met a PwC partner, and that's how they came here. You may be graduating without any money, and you may have the debt, but you've got the time to go be the role model. And you've got the time to get to that Boys and Girls Club. So as my partner was asking me, looking back, on everything that we'd gotten done, my only statement was, I wish I could have done more, or that we could have done more on the inclusion and the diversity. Now, I don't know why it happened, but for whatever reason, two days later, Tom Myrick called me, and it was a money call. And he said, you know, Eddie, I don't know where it came from, but we got wind that you want to do something to fund the students in terms of improving the diversity within this program. I said, Tom, it must be magic because that is where I am. And I tell you what, there's not been a better feeling in terms of this, this gift and this trying to contribute just as all of you the donors here are, to the success of all of you scholars. As I look at what makes this program special, I know you're already, the gray matter's there, it took you that to get here. But what I'm looking at is how deep are we going on the ethics? Are we in fact going to the point that we understand there's never a right way to do the wrong thing? Are we also going to the point that ethics always trumps economics. And that for us as students, we're always gonna do our best when we become leaders because that's where you're heading to make the right decisions. You're now the role models as you leave here and that's the expectation and that you're gonna contribute and you're gonna help that next group down you're going to get this debt paid off because you will double your salary in five years and then you're going to be able to start giving back. If I look back in terms of the influence on me as to why did I do this, yeah, it was the right thing to do. But was part of it Buck Covington and the seven years I spent with him with the inner city kids in D.C.? Or was it Kenneth Johnson? Or was it the time I went to get my room and they said, you may want to look, go check it out first. And I say, no, I take my room assignments however they are. And it was an African-American student. And I smiled and said, you know, this is, this is where I need to be. I appreciate that call, Tom, that you gave me to give this little quick, uh, I hope it was quick enough. 
Uh, Pam was supposed to give me the two-minute mark. At, well, I got eight, eight minutes. Am I way past? Okay. Anyway, <laughs> that's all I have. But I tell you what, there's something much, much better than what you're going to ever hear from me. And that's what's coming up, I think, Doug, with Dominique, who was one of our first-year recipients in terms of the Charles E. Sams Fellowship. Thank you, and have a good evening.